Over the next year, every day of the week, every hour of the day, Victoria Police will be conducting drug tests in more places more often. 150,000 drug tests. They're all across Victoria. TAC, towards zero. I go down to the shore in the morning and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out. And I say, oh, I am miserable. What shall, what should I do? And the sea says in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. When I was posted as a diplomat to Europe, I learned that North Korea is not a socialist paradise, which I was taught. So from that time on, the suspicion inside me is growing, but that didn't mean that I would defect North Korea. Thay Yong Ho's doubts about the regime he served emerged long ago. The prominent North Korean defector spoke in episode 6 about the Kim dynasty's shadowy money-making agency, Division 39, and the suspicion that it was involved in the Pongsu's heroin shipment. There is no any kind of, you know, something like snapshots triggering point of the defection because it is really a long evolution process. Thay was holding out in hope that North Korea would one day open up and become more like China or Vietnam. Though both countries remain one-party communist states, their citizens overwhelmingly enjoy more freedoms and opportunities than North Koreans. But in 2011, Thay's hope for change was dashed when a young Kim Jong-un succeeded his late father, Kim Jong-il. As you may have heard, the mysterious nation of North Korea introduced a new leader over the weekend. An introduction of the heir apparent to the Kim family dynasty, Kim Jong-un. If Kim Jong-un is like his grandfather or his father, then the next 30 or 40 or even 50 years will be the same. Thay was one of North Korea's elite. He didn't go hungry or freeze in the cold like so many others. But he'd tasted freedom through diplomatic postings in Denmark, Sweden and the United Kingdom. And so had his wife and their two boys. My sons... They switched from North Korean totalitarian and communist ideological education to free, you know, democratic education of the Britons. And this kind of, you know, change of the systems in our life made my sons to look into their future. What is the merit of living in North Korea? Ultimately, it was Thay's love for his sons and fear for their futures which brought him to the point of no return in London in 2016. So as a father, I thought that it is my last mission to cut off, you know, this kind of slavery system, you know, for my sons. But in choosing his sons, they would have to make an unimaginable sacrifice. We'll hear about the high price of his freedom later this episode. Thay's choice also caused him to doubt the value of his entire life's work. It was very sad you know, for me because I dedicated all my 50 years of life for this system and for this country. And that the day when I left North Korean embassy, that was really the day of the acceptance of my failure of my life in the 50 years. After his defection, Thay and his immediate family ended up where so many of his North Korean compatriots already had, in South Korea. In South Korea, there are more than uh, 33,000 North Korean defectors here. This makes South Korea the obvious place to go if you're trying to learn about the life and motivations of defectors. And so it was that in 2004, many months after the crew of the Pong Su had been captured and charged with criminal offences, Federal Police Detective Celeste Johnston found herself in the South Korean capital of Seoul. What was your level of knowledge of North Korea before this? Oh, non-existent. Celeste was there to build the police's case against the most important men from the Pong Su. And to do that, she needed to learn more about the way North Korean society works. Last episode, we heard how Teng, Lee, Lam and Wong all pleaded guilty to heroin trafficking, resulting in long stretches in Victorian prisons. 
We also met the Pong Su Cruise solicitor, Jack Dalziel, and heard how he came to be involved in the case of a lifetime. Well, I originally I sent a letter to the embassy, just to where these people needed some sort of legal help. We heard how the police and prosecutors tried, but failed, to have every person aboard the Pong Su committed to stand trial for aiding and abetting the heroin import. There's 30 people on the vessel, and ultimately it's 30 different criminal cases, and it's extremely difficult. It takes a long time, and it's a very, very big matter. And we finish with the Pong Su's master son and his two senior engineers being committed to stand trial, while the rest of the crew were sent to the Baxter Immigration Detention Centre in the Australian desert to await deportation. But the police and prosecutors weren't finished with one of the crew. The Pong Su's people watcher, political secretary Choi Dong Song. They plucked Choi from the detention centre and put him back in jail with Master Sun and the two engineers to await trial in the Victorian Supreme Court. The AFP were of the opinion that there was sufficient evidence to prove that he had knowledge of what was going on and the DPP agreed with that. The Pong Su's disciplinarian and confession taker, political secretary Choi, was one of the main reasons Celeste was in Seoul. Lead prosecutor John Champion accompanied Celeste to South Korea. One of the men charged was Choi Dong Song, the, the political secretary of the ship. Uh, that brought in an element that we needed to deal with. Understanding Choi's role was central to the whole prosecution case. Because of the authority of that man, would he have had to have known that there was heroin on, on the ship? In other words, because of his role, was he someone that simply had to know what the true purpose of the voyage was? Susan Armour also went to South Korea, looking for clues as to how much Choi, Master Sun and the engineers might have known about the Pong Su's cargo. It was incredibly difficult for the police to obtain evidence. Today, Susan's a Victorian magistrate. But back in 2004, she was a senior instructing solicitor for the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, and crucial to the building of the case against the Pong Su 4. Little was known about North Korea. That trip was we were advised that there were two defectors who were in a position to give some relevant evidence. Susan can't recall in any detail what the defectors said more than 15 years ago. But she does have a vivid memory from the South Korea visit of an unscheduled and unofficial day trip. We took ourselves off on a, effectively a tour to view the DMZ and that was fascinating. It's, um, it's very close to Seoul. For me, it was almost shockingly close. It felt like the distance perhaps between Melbourne and Geelong or perhaps another half hour further than that, but it was not a great distance. During the time there, we discovered there are a lot of South Koreans who never made that journey. They lived in Seoul but did not go near the DMZ and perhaps it was easier to live your life without recognising how close North Korea was. The DMZ is shorthand for the demilitarised zone that separates North and South Korea. In an age of intercontinental ballistic missiles, the DMZ serves more of a symbolic purpose than anything else. I remember we were in, the, it was a large, effectively a viewing room. So you filed into this enormous hall which had floor-to-ceiling glass and sort of um, a bit like theatre seats going up the side. So you could sort of sit down, it was all staggered down with this enormous window that was window panes rather than sheet glass. And then you looked out across over the DMZ. And it was, um, my recollection is denuded of any wood. It was just bare, stark, and felt like a different country, despite the fact that it was only a few feet away. I'm an old white male with a beard, so I, 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 I'm very good in court. I, I have gravitas and all kinds of things, you see. Bryn Hibbert is an emeritus professor of analytical chemistry at the University of New South Wales. The federal police wanted Professor Hibbert and some of his colleagues to tell them the origin of the heroin brought to Australia by the Pong Su. I spoke to him on a scratchy video hookup from his home in regional New South Wales. How did you go about then trying to identify or connect it to a particular geographic region? See, we've got this stuff called heroin, but of course it's not, it's not just heroin. It's, it, there's a whole bunch of other compounds that come via the opium poppy and all this stuff, the other alkaloids as we call them. But there's also a, a, a load of 
chemicals that appear during the processing. There are other chemicals that they add to cut the, the, the stuff and, and the like. Professor Hibbert was looking for chemical signatures common to known opium producing areas like Myanmar, Afghanistan or Mexico. The sheer size of the Pongsu's hole made this a complex job. Samples were also sent to the US Drug Enforcement Administration's lab. And because this was such a big seizure, we had the problem of having to, to sample uh, you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blocks that, that we found. So I think we took a hundred and, about 100 random blocks that we then sampled and, and looked at the kinds of chemicals that were in them. And then my job was to say, well, are they all the same, all from the same place? Professor Hibbert's analysis only told police part of the story of the Pongsu's heroin. We looked at a variety of different um, chemical compounds that we would expect to find with uh, a shipment from Southeast Asia. This, this was the working hypothesis, that this was all from somewhere in Southeast Asia. Uh, Asia. Now, two things happened. One was that some of the box didn't have the chemicals that should be there if they were from Southeast Asia, and other blocks had other chemicals that we've never seen coming from Southeast Asia at all. But we weren't absolutely sure where we came from. And indeed, when we eventually wrote the paper, our conclusion was that we didn't know where they, where they came from. But the Pong Su had obviously been on a bit of a cruise and was, was collecting stuff from all over before it finally headed to, to Australia. Uh, it's not my area, but I think that was the first time that we really saw that happening that um, this kind of shopping basket of stuff that before it comes into the country. In a video from the time of the bust, you can hear Des Appleby reading the label of the distinctive red and white branding found on the packets of the Pong Su's heroin. Just turn it over. OK. Double U-O globe brand. The branding has a round circle, with two lions putting their front paws on top of a world globe. The name WO Globe brand, 100%, is printed in English in capital letters and Chinese characters. Just like with clothes, shoes and cars, brands are a big part of the drug trade. It's about branding, so it's an advertisement that if you're looking at it, that's what it is. So to have them in those pristine uh, wrapping, they're very easy to sell on the illicit drug market because you're getting stuff straight out of the factory. So it's it, couldn't get any better, and you're getting very high quality heroin, very pure heroin, and the WO Globe is, is one of the major brands, probably the number one brand. But on closer inspection by expert document examiners at the AFP, the UO Globe branding on the Pongsu's heroin wasn't what it seemed. The branding of the heroin, it, um, to them it looks like it's copied. So there's a forensic examination of it, but they, they told me at the time that they believe it's not actual WO Globe. Not that these people have a trademark on their, <laughs> on their heroin blocks, but um, uh, it looks like it was copied and made to replicate what, what WO Globe should be like. Division 39, North Korea's foreign currency raising agency, has expertise in forging banknotes and other documents. Des remains puzzled as to where the Pongsu's heroin actually came from, but he has his suspicions. In this case, they're not from Myanmar. We know that. We've got reference samples. We can prove it's not from there. It's not Afghanistan heroin. It's not from uh, Mexico. Uh, it's from somewhere else. And, yeah, it was loaded in North Korea. North Korea, they do have poppies. We hear rumours, of course, and there's intelligence provided, but uh, certainly I suspect that they either got opium somehow, whether they grew it themselves or they got it from other parts of the world, but certainly it was refined by people, chemists, that, that law enforcement hadn't seen before. So in a lab situation, very well made heroin. There's no North Korean heroin, for example, in our library of samples. So we need to reference samples to say, well, that, that was grown in that region. We don't have that. Many North Korean defectors have spoken of government-run poppy fields in the countryside. Here's a defector giving testimony to the US Senate in 2003 about the systematic illicit drug program inside North Korea. Well, the North Korean regime has spent very 
busy making and selling the illegal drugs to other countries in order to support the cash-strapped regime. North Korea must be the only country, as far as I can tell, on the entire globe to run a drug production trafficking business on a state level. From his new home in Seoul, Thay Yong Ho told me the Kim family regime will do anything to make money. After three years, he's still dealing with the consequences of his life-changing decision to defect. But in one sense, Thay had no choice. North Korea had its own dilemmas. To drum up funds, it has to engage with capitalism in various forms. But if it lets lots of people do that, they might become too fond of that way of life. So it has a core class of privileged folk who only get to keep their privileges if they play by the regime's rules. They grew up in that core class. My family belonged to the core class, which meant that we enjoyed political privileges and economic benefits. So when I was 14, I was able to go to English school where I started to learn English and that kind of opportunity cannot be provided to normal North Korean pupils. And in that school, even though North Korea was very much isolated and hostile to America and the rest of English speaking countries, but that kind of school for uh, elite group uh, was special. So I even was able to watch a British film like Mary Poppins or American films like Sound of Music. High on a hill was a lonely goat herd lay, hood lay, hood lay. The core now class the of the society has a little bit, you know, the better solidarity uh, sentiments with the Kim family for the maintaining of this, uh, the system. A word from our sponsor. Over the next year, every day of the week, every hour of the day, Victoria Police will be conducting drug tests in more places more often. 150,000 drug tests. They're all across Victoria. TAC towards zero. While the long and complex legal process continued to unfurl and the police investigation was still going, the Pong Su remained berthed in Sydney Harbour. She'd become a headache Des could do without. I came to hate the vessel because uh, it was obviously stored in Sydney Harbour. There we had some experts on board, proper marine guys that actually looked after the vessel for us. So, uh, so it had to be manned 24 hours a day. Uh, it was actually leaking, so it, um, we had to put a, a boom around it to stop the oil from going into Sydney Harbour. Um, and where we actually brought the boat back to, or Sydney Harbour is the most expensive part of uh, Australia to actually store a vessel. Uh, it cost $2,500 a day throughout the, the whole time it was there. In a case with a huge number of exhibits, the Pong Su was the biggest and most important one. As such, she had to be kept in the same place and accessible until all the legal action had finished. For the maintaining and storage and uh, disposal of the vessel was more than $5 million. And each of those bills came across my desk. I had to process them. And, um, you know, you get all sorts of weird things happen, like in Sydney Harbour, the local residents got sick of looking at the Pong Sioux because it's a rust bucket sitting in a you know, beautiful harbour. And they would make complaints about it. And uh, again, you have to deal with all that. We've heard before how Australian police and customs officers pursuing the Pong Su at sea saw crew throw items overboard. Also how the SAS troops who boarded her found the remnants of burned documents in the Pong Su's furnace. But not everything had been destroyed. The contents of a particular rubbish bin were of high interest. Prosecutor John Champion. As I recall that, that uh, the political secretary had, there was a, a piece of evidence that suggested that it had come from his room or his cabin on the ship. It was, a, I think, a, a piece of paper that was in fairly poor condition, which had something on it. These scraps of paper found in political secretary Choi's room had handwritten messages on them. 
They read like a report back to someone elsewhere. Whoever wrote them knew a fair bit about what had happened at Boggley Creek. Landed crew will deal with it quickly towards East Course. Our ship in other country. Person who got off from our ship. The other one, arrested. When confronted about the notes, political secretary Choi said he didn't know who wrote them and he'd never seen them before. He claimed lots of crew members came to visit his room and that he didn't empty his bin every day. Unlike Master Sun and his two senior engineers, political secretary Choi had initially been discharged along with the rest of the crew by Melbourne magistrate Duncan Reynolds. But prosecutor John Champion had made the big call to directly present political secretary Choi at trial. So anything that could show he knew why Wong and the man who drowned at Boggley Creek were on board was like gold. But he wasn't having an easy time of it. We had no personal information about them. In criminal cases, there's often people that give you intelligence about somebody. Uh, or the police have got some history of an, an accused person. So you're able to find out a little bit about what, what makes them tick. We had nothing about what made these people tick because there was just nothing that came out of North Korea about them. Out in the middle of nowhere, it was um, very isolated. Uh, lawyers had a devil of a time getting in. Prominent Australian human rights advocate Pamela Kerr has been visiting detention centres around Australia since 1999. The way she sees it, the challenges facing prosecutors in the Pong Su case were nothing to those faced by the ship's crew. Back in 2004, most of the Pong Su crew were being held at Baxter Detention Centre in the South Australian desert, awaiting deportation. At that time, you know, Baxter was a kind of purpose-built detention centre and it it comprised uh, six or seven compounds with um, solid walls that curved in. So all you could see was the sky. So when people locked up in a compound, they could never see out. They never knew where they were and it was strictly controlled. They were bussed in a little van from their compound to the visit section where local people and advocates came to visit. Pamela was being fed a lot of information from inside that detention centre. Some of it concerned the mental state of some new arrivals. I got a call from one of the guys and he said that they'd been allowed to walk from their compound to visits, which was very unusual because they were bust everywhere so they, nobody knew what was going on. And he said, as we passed this compound that was never occupied, we could see these men and their fingers. They were holding on to the top of the fence and they were crying out, help. The compound walls were solid. Um, Nobody could see out. They were very distressed. And he said, nobody knew what language they were speaking. They looked like people from Asia, but the Chinese and the Vietnamese couldn't identify it. And they were clearly distressed. Things were intense for the Pong Su men being held at Baxter. In April 2004, a year since their capture at sea, many of the crew were preparing to go on a hunger strike inside the detention centre. Up until this point, the North Koreans had remained remarkably disciplined. They steadfastly refused to cooperate with Australian police and denied any knowledge of the heroin importation. But one of the younger crew members, who was on his first voyage on the Pong Su, Radio room operator Jong Hok Dong started doing some highly unusual and risky things. Dong could write in English and he began to send letters to Australian authorities. He warned them about the hunger strike plan. He also suggested that while most of the detained crew should be sent home, the Australians would be wise to keep questioning political secretary Choi. No one knows why Dong decided to do this or if he was trying to become a defector like Thay Yong Ho. In the end, he told the Australians he was only pretending to help and was suffering from schizophrenia. Perhaps Dong had only just realised how much danger he had placed himself in with his own people. Dong was deported along with the rest of the crew in 2004. His compatriots knew nothing about his contact with Australian officials. With 26 out of the 30 Pong Su crew sent home, 
Even the prosecution team, who worked bloody hard to have them all stand trial, were worried about what might happen once they were back in North Korea. Lead prosecutor, John Champion. Uh, there was a, a great degree of uncertainty uh, on our part as to what would become of them, whether they would be perhaps regarded as heroes or whether they would be regarded as failures. Human rights campaigner Pamela Kerr had heard stories of life inside North Korea from other defectors who'd made it to Australia. We had a couple of North Korean refugees in the pipeline at that stage and their stories were horrific. And they only got out because of the freezing cold winter, the river froze over and they escaped. I remember a woman telling me her family said, none of us will survive, you have the best chance, you've got to go across the river. So she crossed the frozen river, not knowing if it would give way because there was no guarantee. But she got right across and there was a bit of an underground network in South Korea run by Christians um, and they got her out. These stories caused Pamela to fear greatly for the futures of the Pongsu men in North Korea. She wanted to find out if they'd been offered an opportunity by Australia to defect. But the men were gone before she could get an answer. I was trying to get um, lawyers to assist them. The next thing I heard was from people in the... There were a great group of supporters in um, Port Augusta and they said this a diplomatic cars have been coming out here with men in very um, good suits. Not the usual wear in Port Augusta, I can tell you. And so they... And the next thing I knew, the guys were gone. They might have wanted to go home or they might have been fearful of what was going to happen to them. But they had no choice because they were held in communicado and then they were pushed out of the country. It's funny what you do and don't remember from a long time ago. Among Susan Armour's early recollections of some of the men she got to know a little as solicitor on the Pong Su trial is a distinct and poignant detail. I remember seeing them very early on in the piece. And they were older men with black hair. And after a couple of months, I remember a court hearing where they came to court and they were older men and they were all totally grey. And I remember, and I think I'd been up to view the ship at this point in time, which was fairly, uh, fairly basic living conditions. And I remember thinking it was that small thing of vanity. They were dyeing their hair. They, in fact, were grey but they had been one of their small vanities, perhaps small luxuries, was they dyed their hair. Later, after the men had been repatriated to North Korea, she too wondered about their fate. I was concerned for their well- well-being or their safety. It wasn't known as a benign regime and much would depend on the view of the powers that be as to whether they were expendable. This question about the expendability of human life in North Korea will probably linger a lifetime for defector Tha Yong Ho. So when my family decided to leave North Korean embassy, we stopped. When we uh, walked 100 metres, all my family members turned round and we looked at the embassy again. The North Korean flag was flying in the sky. We knew quite well that my family's defection would be very good thing for my family, but on the meanwhile, we should be ready to accept the sacrifice of my uh, relatives and my brother and sister who are left in North Korea. I can't imagine how tortured Thay must have felt and still feels about making this decision. He knows that North Korea severely punishes families of defectors, especially high profile ones. They doesn't know for sure what happened to his siblings or their own families, but they were most likely rounded up and taken to a forced labour camp where they will remain until death. That's even if they're still alive. It was really a very painful decision. I am absolutely sure that most of the North Korean diplomats and their children are not happy with their lives in uh, North Korea. But the point is that whether you are ready to choose, you know, for your own 
future or if you are not ready to sacrifice your colleagues or your uh, relatives left in North Korea. So this is really a great dilemma for all North Korean diplomats and their children. And as far as I am concerned and the member of my family concerned that we decided that we couldn't go on. Coming up on the last voyage of the Pong Su. Well, it was a quintessential circumstantial case. You can't look at this case through our Australian eyes. It, it staggered me, quite frankly, and I thought, well, there's obviously something going on in the background that I thought was unaware of. This was not North Korea on trial. These were the individuals. The last voyage of the Pong Su is brought to you by the newsrooms of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. To read more and to watch the videos referenced in this episode, head to our websites. While you're there, why not take out a subscription to help power independent Australian journalism and productions like this podcast. If you're enjoying this series, leave a review on iTunes and recommend us to a friend. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is reported by Richard Baker. Field recording and audio editing by executive producer Rachel Dexter. Narrative consultant is Kate Cole Adams. Siobhan McHugh is consulting producer. Music and composition by Vicky Hansen. Sound design and mixing by John Greenfield. Assistant producer is Margaret Gordon. And Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Thanks to our cast of actors. Chi Kwan Lee is played by Andy Song. Kyum Fa Teng is played by Anthony Ting. And Yao Kim Lam is played by Jason Chong. Casting by Catapult Casting. Script translations by Yan Zhuang. Additional audio from Associated Press, ABC News America and Richard Rogers. The poem you heard at the start of this episode is called I Go Down to the Shore by Mary Oliver, read by Jason Chong.